kick this off? We're already at 7.05 and we have precious sure. time here. Um, I'm Will Fenton, Director of Scholarly Innovation at the Library Company of Philadelphia. For those of you who haven't heard of the Library Company, we are one of the oldest cultural institutions in America. Our claim to fame is that we were founded by Benjamin Franklin as the first subscription library in 1731, but we've changed a lot since then. We're using Zoom now. Um, so a lot has changed over the past 300 years. Now we are a, a very important research library for anyone working in early American literature, history, or culture. Um, and we have a tremendous uh, group of research fellows that have passed through, including the one that we'll be speaking tonight. Um, fireside chats are our attempt to sort of sustain our community that we would normally nourish in person. Um, remotely. So we've invited folks that have done research with our collections to come back and share great projects that they're working on. It might be a book talk, it might be um, a work in progress, it might be a journal article, but really it's about sort of communicating the stakes of a particular project in a succinct format that is readily accessible to anyone who doesn't necessarily, you know, have a PhD after their name. That's very important. So um, I wanted to just give a little bit of uh, context also about the structure of this particular um, uh, webinar here. Um, we, we will not be inviting folks to actually call in, so to speak, with questions. We have a Q&A button. So if you cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A button. You can type your questions at any time. And I could see that uh, Michael Duffy and Gloria Galanes have already used that. Thank you for being model citizens. Um, and so throughout this talk, if you have any questions at any time, you're welcome to just go ahead and type them there. And I will do my best, my very best to get in as many of you as possible. So I'm gonna moderate it based upon the order that I receive them. So that is an incentive for you to pose your questions early. Uh, but of course, we'll do our best to get through things. Um, I also wanted to um, highlight the fact that with our last fireside chat with Aaron Fogelman, we followed up by email with some session notes. Mm -hmm. Any notes that I collect along the way, I'll be using the chat feature, which again, you can access at the bottom of the screen. If you have other resources that you wanna share, I encourage you to do that, or you can just email them to me. And then what I'll do is I'll send out a sort of recap email at the end so that you can continue learning um, if this is something that you're really excited about. Our firesides are automatically recorded uh, with a very light editing. We then put them up on YouTube. So if you know folks that you think would be really excited about this, that weren't able to attend for one reason or another, you'll have a link that you can share. Uh, just give us a week or two to get that up. Um, so aside from that, uh, if you happen to you know, really enjoy this experience, I encourage you to use the donate button on the Fireside's Chats page. I know it's a little bit crude to plug a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a donation form, but we have this great little earmark now for a COVID-19 fund which will help us sustain a lot of our core operations while we're going through this difficult time. So it doesn't have to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. If you have a couple dollars that you wanna to donate to the library company, we, we welcome your generosity. So with that, I'd like to talk about our guest today. Today I'm, jo I'm joined by Dr. Etta Madden, Assistant Department Head and Professor of English at Missouri State University. Dr. Madden has served in various administrative capacities and taught courses in American literature, women's history, or sorry, women's literature and gender studies, utopian literature and culture, sounds amazing, and research methods. Her publications include books and articles on religious communities, including Puritans, Shakers, Quakers, and Earth-centered New Age groups in Italy. Also really interesting. Uh, women writers, including Philadelphia cookbook author Eliza Leslie and the history of science. She is a recipient of not one, but two Library Company Fellowships, first in 2000 when she researched Benjamin Rush and Temperance, and more recently in 2013 when she researched Anne Hampton Brewster, the subject of tonight's fireside ch chat, Mediterranean Quarantine, Perspectives of a Person of Privilege. Thank you, Etta. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to say thank you to the friends and family, especially that may be streaming this. They know that I talk excessively and obsessively about Anne Hampton Brewster and other women in Italy. Um, so this is their chance to know a little bit more about what I've been working on. Also, even though I researched Brewster um, beginning in 2013 at the library company, I was telling Will before um, we got started tonight that this topic, um, quarantine and cholera 
is something new for me that I just came across within the last six weeks. So this material is fairly fresh and I look forward to the questions that you might have. I am, um, I am going to begin with a PowerPoint and I'll be using that throughout. So give me just a moment to share my screen here. Um, and I've already, I've already um, had a few bit of finger problems here on my surface. So just a <laughs> second. Now okay. that Edda squared away, I'm going to disappear for the next 20, well, 25 minutes. Let's wait to be sure that I'm actually um, squared away because right, I have trouble, right. I'm having trouble getting to the start button. Um, I think there's a slideshow but, uh, tab. Yeah, but it's covered by my sharing screen right now. So mm -hmm. hold on, let me. We tried to have this going before everybody got on, but then that was a problem. And now, like this, and now, this one. All right, is it sharing now? Oh, it's lovely. So okay, thank you. Sorry, everyone. So I, I want to begin with um, a newspaper article, actually a journal article from the British Medical Journal from 1868 that sets the context for responses to cholera outbreak and that, um, that year. Some of you have already read a snippet from this on Facebook. The title is The Recent Vexatious Quarantine. In the article, the author explains that Spain and Portugal were enforcing a quarantine um, upon all the ships and passengers in the Mediterranean that wanted to come into their ports, and it was because of cholera. This was the third outbreak of the infectious disease in the 19th century. The complaints about it, the journal article explained, were numerous. I think you're going to see some resonances of what we uh, have heard during the last uh, couple of months. One of the complaints was about the groundless interruption of free intercourse and infliction of the most unnecessary expense upon shipping, the author wrote. They protested that there was no foundation whatever for the rumor in question uh, of the illness and one problem was misdiagnosis. The problem was not cholera, but common fevers of the hot season. They were what was causing the extremely young and the extremely old to die. Another complaint was that everyone was quarantined, both well and ill passengers that were on board the ships coming into port. The well passengers, the author wrote, should be able to go about their business. They shouldn't have to be quarantined. The bottom line was that ignorance, a lack of certainty about diseases and diagnoses, led to inconvenience and above all, financial woes. Another problem was inconsistencies. Inconsistencies of enforcing the quarantines. There were people who were winking at the rules and that annoyed some. So I have a longer quote from the article about these inconsistencies. One vessel with a cargo of Cuba that arrived after a 46 days voyage at Malta had no sickness on the voyage and all on board were in good health. As cholera and yellow, yellow fever existed in Cuba, however, when the vessel sailed, she brought a foul bill with, with her. She was, in consequence, ordered to leave Malta at once, but there were no provisions on board. So a few hours respite was granted and then she was forced to leave port. Scarcely was that vessel out of sight, but another laden with sugar arrived. She had left Cuba at the same time, but had performed a quarantine of five days elsewhere at Marseille before unloading her cargo of rum. At that point, she changed her papers showing that her point of origin was Marseille, not Cuba, so that when she arrived at Malta, she was admitted without any delay. The author concluded, quote, the whole machinery of the system is a means of levying heavy expenses upon every ship during the period of detention. And moreover, the salaries of the officials consist mainly of the fees thus obtained. Fiscal consideration as much as regard for public health may be confidently asserted. 
the result of these kinds of complaints, the quarantines were shortened or removed. Now, this article's reference to Cuba and the Mediterranean in a British journal, of course, reminds us of the global situation of commerce and passenger travels. It connects Europe to the Americas and points to the influence of publications like the Medical Journal and other newspapers on the larger public discourse of disease. It connects us to the subject of my talk, the friend of the Library Company of Philadelphia, Anne Hampton Brewster, the person of privilege who's at uh, the center of my work. She too wrote of her economic concerns, the inconveniences, and she wrote of inconsistencies. So who was Anne Hampton Brewster? So this painting hangs in the reading room of the library company, or it did the last time I was there. Um, I wanna use it to say something about Anne Hampton Brewster as a person of privilege. Who was she? She was a wealthy white woman from Philadelphia with ancestry that went back to the Mayflower. Her brother, Benjamin, was a successful attorney. The family owned real estate. Her brother, Benjamin, would later become the US Attorney General. In short, she was refined and well-read. This, this painting has notes with it that say the woman is supposed to be Anne Hampton Brewster, who owned a dog, you may be able to see down in the bottom of the picture, and she was a close friend of Lloyd P. Smith, the librarian. But two items I want to note here about the painting. First, the woman stands with her back to the viewer, a rather demure position, much less important than that of the librarian. And second, George Wood painted this in 1880. When he painted it, Brewster was 60 years old and living in Rome, where she had been writing letters as a news correspondent for more than a decade. So the painting is an idealized representation. She was far away. And as you'll see in another image, she was less than demure. After her death in 1892, she left her books, papers, and several other personal items to the library company, the records that provide a story of her life, which is much larger than what I'll share tonight, and her reactions to quarantine and cholera. So during her time in Rome, between 1868 and 1890, Brewster wrote more than 500 news articles. Think of Sylvia Pagioli. She primarily published in Philadelphia and Boston, but also the country, across the country. Her stories appeared from north to south, all the way to California, and with reprints scattered through small towns in Missouri, in Louisiana, in Tennessee. And she also wrote for periodicals such as Lippincott's. One brief biography written by Denise Larrabee and published by the Library Company in the 1990s provides a, a good overview of Brewster's life and a list of her newspaper correspondence. She also explains that Brewster wrote glowing stories about life in Rome. What I would underscore is these stories fed the wheel of her career by recruiting additional travelers to leave the US and come to Rome. So one of the key points I wanna to make tonight is that she depended upon these American readers and travelers for her emotional and economic stimulus. So what we see in the text that she left behind is her public desire to be very positive about Italy as a site for tourists, even in the midst of epidemic. However, her attitudes changed from her initial frustration about inconveniences and denial that the disease even existed to a slow acknowledgement of the realities of the illness. The realizations are more stark in her private writings, in her journals, than in her newspaper accounts. So tonight what I'm going to be sharing with you is a little bit from the newspaper accounts and a little bit from the private journals that she kept so that we can see this dramatic change that she went through internally, but it's not so obviously in the external publications. Um, so here is the second image that I wanted to show you of Brewster. This was taken uh, by the Fratelli brother, Fratelli D'Alessandri brothers, um, and it was about eight, 1874 when she was at the height of her career. Notice in this image, she is highly confident and presenting herself as a woman of leisure in a classic Roman pose. 
Um, just before she had this photo taken, she wrote in her journal, bragging, I am likely to have more work than I can do from all quarters come orders for letters, New Orleans, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Rochester. And then after the portrait was taken, I've accepted an engagement from the New York world. Thus, I now have 11 letters a month to write, and I'm the correspondent for two of the best journals in America, and also two of the most well-known ones. Before she had arrived in Rome, she had published two novels. Let me back up. Before she had arrived in Rome, she had published two novels, novels a novella, numerous short stories, and helped edit the popular Graham's magazine. So why would she leave Philadelphia for Rome? In short, she had taken her first trip apart, abroad as a woman of privilege a decade earlier in 1857 and 1558. For 18 months, she'd been abroad with several months of that time in Naples. She wanted to return to Italy because it promised her the freedom and independence that she desired. But before she arrived, uh, but when she set out on her um, journey the second time, the cholera outbreak um, had emerged. It was 1868 and, and Cuba, as I mentioned, was the foul point of origin for the outbreak. It had arisen in Havana in the port area, not surprisingly, in an area known for poverty, where there was a regular influx of new persons, including slaves, where the colonial milita military controlled, so there were barracks of the living conditions that contributed to the spread of disease. There were preventive measures like quarantines and spraying the mail with vinegar, but the disease arrived anyway and spread um, throughout the, uh, the triangle of the Mediterranean, England, and um, the Caribbean. Recent scholarship has pointed out how the periodicals of the period, like the British Medical Journal, built from motivations such as pro-slavery or anti-slavery arguments. Newspapers contributed to the discourse by trying to explain differences, for example, between the common illness associated with diarrhea and dysentery and the cholera. They wrote, for example, and I quote, Asiatic cholera was associated with large numbers of Irish and other immigrants, a class of persons particularly exposed and carrying the disease wherever they go, and that it killed considerable number of persons in less than six hours from onset of the symptoms. As lifetime friend of the library company Charles Rosenberg explained about cholera um, some time back and the US, the newly arrived immigrant to the US found all doors closed to him. That was not the case for Brewster arriving in Rome. The medical and lay sources at the time, when we look at them together, point to how stereotypes about how race and class, rather than factual knowledge about transmission, infiltrated the popular thinking about disease and its spread. Journalism then attempted to ensure successful navigation of culturally diverse environments and citizen participants in journalism those who were not physicians, <laughs> contributed with the goal of preserving maritime commerce from contamination, quarantines, and disease-devastated economies. Brewster, of course, was one of those lay sources of journalism who provided her direct testimony. So relevant to Brewster's class affiliation, think about her first Atlantic crossing in 1857, and then I'm gonna ask you to think about her second crossing and then her time in Rome. So first of all, when she traveled in 1857, she had taken a typical quick trip from Washington to DC to Le Havre on the north coast of France. 10 days was the trip at that time. She went with her maid, Lena, her dog, Beauty, and she was on the steamer Arago. One article of the era entitled, Our Luxurious Steamers, describes these boats as models of elegance and comfort and this, with sumptuously furnished saloons in which one can enjoy every luxury from the daintiest viands and the choicest wine to shampoos, porridge, pianos, and organs. Some of you may know Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad, published in 1869. He wrote of approximately 150 passengers on the Quaker City who played horse billiards, something like shuffleboard, charades, and cards, smoked and sewed, read and journaled, sang hymns, and listened to organ music, 
when they weren't looking through opera, gla opera glasses for sea life or sites on land. Maybe something like contemporary cruise ships, maybe not quite the Titanic. But when Brewster went abroad in 1868, she chose a different type of crossing. Hers was nothing like that. She chose to go on a, on a freighter, a slower means of travel and much less comfortable. Why? To save money. She took more of her belongings because she didn't plan to return to Philadelphia and she was determined to be financially independent of her brother, so she was watching her pennies. But she soon learned that the cheaper choice was not without its troubles. Even before she sailed, she lost patience with the ship's captain, whose family, she learned, was not ready for departure and was going to travel with them. She wrote with dismay in her journal, I found to my consternation that the captain's wife and three children are to sail with us. The wife is a blessing, but the babies, I'm afraid, will be a nuisance. They're all babies, too. The eldest only five and the youngest four months. The middle one only 22 months. And she waited in a filthy hotel room for the family's preparation. She reminded herself, using her Italian, pazienza. Once aboard the freighter, the crossing was much more than 10 days. In fact, it was more than 49 days. What did she do to pass the time? She read and she journaled. These records leave us her story. She boasted of reading 26 of Shakespeare's plays between the Straits of Gibraltar and Sardinia. Notably also, one volume in her library, Heron's A Manual of the History of the Political System of Europe, served as a log. She noted, for example, in the upper margin, Monday, noon, 5 October, 68, and then a little bit lower in the margin, 7 October, 68, entrance to the Straits of Gibraltar. So she was not only boning up on her history in preparation for living in Europe, but was also marking her journey. She also expressed in her journal a desire to speed up the slow crossing. Seven weeks tomorrow since we've been out at sea, she wrote, 49 days, hey ho, blow less a fair wind. She called upon the Roman deity of the winds, revealing that her pazienza was wearing thin. Her journal also expresses frustration with the captain and his family. Along the way, he has had what she referred to as a fit. His wife consequently freaked out and Brewster took the 22-month-old twice into her room to quell him. Not her idea of a good time. More importantly, her frustration also emerged right after this because they took a brief port of call in Sardinia where they interacted with a captain from Havana. They would be forced to quarantine upon their arrival at Messina on the Sicilian coast. Brewster confided in her journal, I am very weary and wish to reach Rome or some place where I can sleep at night without anxiety, where I can undress like a Christian and take my bath like a civilized being. Unfortunately, I don't know the details of the quarantine at Messina, but I do know that from Messina, the ship sailed to Naples and at Naples, she uh, took a train through Caserta to finally arrive in Rome. Now, once in Rome, it was within a matter of two years that she started writing, actually sooner than two years, she started writing within her first year about illness in Rome. Sometimes it was larger outbreaks of cholera and typhoid. Sometimes it was references to Roman fever, what uh, we now know of as malaria or bad air. But in her published letters, her privileged views and desires consistently emerge. She considered the outbreaks overblown and exaggerated. She explained cholera was Asiatic and connected to islands and others, not Anglos. She wrote in 1871, for example, the Roman malaria exists more in the imagination than in reality. I have never lived in a town so healthy as Rome especially in the summer season. Those who were ill, Brewster explained, 
were vulnerable because they had chosen poor lifestyles. She also conflated malaria and cholera, similar to conflation of flu and COVID-19. And she explained that some believe the outbreaks were invented as political tools. Here's a quote in that line. There is no cholera in Italy. The editor of L'Univers, the paper supporting the Pope's power, wrote, the argument of the, that paper, Brewster explained, was that the first Catholic Congress was to be held the following month in Venice. Also, the summer season of pilgrimages to Assisi was about to start. Surely the outbreak was invented by the secular municipal governments in order to prevent this religious Congress and to have a plausible excuse for prohibiting the various Catholic pilgrimages to holy places. End quote. Brewster, a Roman Catholic, concluded nonetheless, quote, it seems hardly probable that to prevent a few pilgrimages, the municipality should be willing to ruin the material interest of their cities, which are, for the most part, summer resorts for strangers. Now, this article is from 1873, and I think what we begin to see happening is that from 1871 to 1873, Brewster is beginning to show a change. She's acknowledging the reality of the diseases instead of completely denying them. And her letters, published letters from, from 1873 and 1874, especially are fine examples that show how she herself dealt with the illness and how she advised her privileged readers that they might. Primarily, it was by doing nothing or escaping it. As she wrote, no regular work can be expected under such circumstances, and one reads idly, visits cool art galleries, talks nonsense, or dreams the way the hours as easily as possible. And she recommended taking a ride on the Pincio, where people have lemonades, sherbets and ices brought to them, or they go up to the broad balconies of the casino and enjoy the refreshments, looking over the beautiful view. In fact, in a letter from late summer that year, she revealed that she had left Rome to go to Bagni di Lucca, a resort town with hot springs on the Lima River in the hills of Tuscany. She described in the story the funeral of a cardinal in Rome, but she didn't attend. Instead, she wrote, the day was too hot, the season unhealthy. Numerous Romans ignored the dangers, however, according to a friend and informant who went, she continued with, from that informant. Crowds of Romans lunched in the open air on bread and white wine, devoured watermelons, just as if there was no fever in Rome, no cholera outside her gates. Brewster concluded with a prejudiced remark. These common people who throng in a hot August day in this heavy, unhealthy Roman atmosphere can do this with safety and eat the luscious fruits with impunity. Such digestions, such constitutions. In the same story, she elaborated on the outbreak around the Vatican with a history of the area being troubled with fever. 1,000 subaltern employees and people of service were down with fever of showing signs of the disease. But, she added, the civic authorities were busy with precautions. Private dwellings are examined, also cellars and courtyards in which long forgotten heaps of dirt and offal have accumulated. Laundry houses are placed on the Tiber banks where the linen used by cholera patients is washed, she continued, and the laundry women are protected from the contagion. Convents and churches, including the Quattro Coronati, were arranged for reception of patients, and quarantine halls were designated in the local hospitals. Night pharmacies and sanitary bureaus established throughout the city had provided aid for more than a month. And more of those might be established, she explained. She concluded, all of this as though to soothe concerns of American tourists. The health arrangements of the city are in good order and the municipality is doing all it can to guard the city from any great mortality in case the cholera comes down upon its people. Of course, she wrote this 
from her green shady watering place in Tuscany, made deliciously fresh, these are her words, made deliciously fresh by several mountain torrents, which give a constant freshness and purity to the air. Now, in contrast to these positive publications, Brewster's journal entries show she was not well. The published letters provide a public face to her private status. She wrote in her journal, early in January, I had a severe attack of fever. I was dangerously ill. The house I lived in on the Sistina was very unhealthy owing to the bad drains on either side. As soon as possible, I moved into this apartment, and you see the picture there on your screen. This apartment, which is high, healthy, and airy. But soon after, she wrote of a recurrence of the fever during Carnivale, after she went out into the Corso to witness it. Her public face shifted slightly also as she wrote of the Pope's illness and near death in a spring 1874 letter. On Saturday night, it was reported that His Holiness was dead, she wrote, but it turned out he only had a culpa d'aria and that his illness had been greatly exaggerated. She goes into more detail, but I won't for the sake of time. She transitioned from discussing about the Pope to older people in general. Guess what? She was now 55. She felt older people's pains. She wrote of how the weather impacted them. The winter and spring in Rome this year have been trying, especially to old persons. The Italians call the season a severe one. It has been no worse than our keen wet November weather at home. Still, as Roman apartments are not constructed for the slightest cold weather, it's no wonder all of us have felt this unusual season sensibly. It's tested the armor of our health shown us many a little weak flaw, many an old bronchial cough and ache and pain, which have lain dormant for years, have cropped up again in full force. She elaborated again on physical and emotional problems in her journal in May, three years after she um, got sick going out, three months after she got sick going back out to witness carnival. She confessed in her journal, I cannot see for the life of me what I have to complain about. No one living that I know makes their life so completely as I am allowed. I rise when I please, spend my days as I like. I can give all my time to the sort of study that pleases me. I'm not obliged to work. My income, even lessened as it is, is enough for my needs. So after reasoning out the matter thus this morning, I found myself lighter in spirits, but I am not well physically. Get this. This afternoon, I'm nervous and irritable. What is the matter with me? A month later, she took up the topic publicly. This time, it's in the article on the right side of the screen, she emphasized how to deal with the season of fevers. One example, the prime minister fled to Innsbruck with his wife, who nearly died from diphtheria. Similarly, the King Victor Emmanuel constantly suffered in the city, she wrote. Quote, from the moment he pokes his ugly nose into Rome, the fever lurks all the time in his veins. He flies from one place to another, sleeps one night in the Quirinale Palazzetto, another at Villa Ludovisi, another at Castel Gondolfo, but without effect. He can neither eat, drink, nor sleep in Rome, and thanks God when he is well out of the capital of his kingdom. And she concluded that article with data on death rates. Rome, she wrote, is fourth lowest on the list of all the great cities of the globe, only slightly above London, Brussels, and Philadelphia. New York, Naples, Florence, and Berlin are all higher. Deaths are no higher than in the previous year, and no higher than in Berlin. She concluded with words that I want to leave you as my conclusion this evening before the Q&A. She advised, sleep well, get out of the sun, talk, walk, indulge in ices, ad libitum. If possible, get a great airy apartment on the top of a high palace and on the summit of a high hill 
from the windows of which you can see grand old ruins, campagna, and mountains. Surround yourself with old books. Read how foolishly men have warred and wrangled in every age, how humanity has tried in every way to do God's work, and how the great power has kept on and on, unmindful of all these futile mortal struggles. Your heart and soul will grow quiet within you. You will say, omnia venitas, all, all is vanity, but that patience and hope that begetteth rest. Brewster wrote this advice, of course, to herself. She was six years into her time in Rome, and she had begun to realize that she was not immune. She, too, was impacted by contagious disease and associated emotional strains. Much was beyond her control, but she controlled what she could. Living in 14 rooms of the Palazzo Albani, high on Rome's Quirinal Hill, and escaping to watering holes such as Bagni de Luca were two of the choices she made. Her story of privileged choices, I hope, continues to resonate with us. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your research, Etta. Um, this sounds like a rich project and you found a lot of diary sources to work with, didn't you? She uh, wrote thousands of pages in multiple journals that are all there in the archives. Oh, that's great. So I want to um, uh, telegraph the contrarian here. If okay. somebody would come to you and say, why write, why do all of this research? You've been working on this project on and off since 2013. What sustains your interest? Why write about this woman of privilege? I've been asked that question before. Um, it's a good one. It's really important when you think about how she's escaping, you know, escaping uh, what a lot of other people cannot escape. And I think it's important because it speaks to some of us who recognize our privileges and reminds us of the discrepancies between the way different people are living. But one important part of what she's doing is paying attention to the political life in Rome. So that reference to the king, for example, and how he couldn't stand the capital of his kingdom. Um, that's a political bite there that has to do with the upheaval that's happening in Rome um, during the period of its unification. So a big part of my project is about her engagement with the political environment of Rome. So I'd like to start bringing in some questions and I do encourage everybody watching to use the Q&A function if you ever move to ask a question. I'm gonna to try to work through them sort of as they arrive, but I might jump around. All right, so um, John, John Schmaltz Bauer, I hope I didn't butcher that name. I'm sorry, John. Uh, asked a question that sort of brings class and um, denialism together in an interesting way. He says, all of this talk about misdiagnosis sounds remarkably similar to today. Um, I could picture folks saying the cholera is the same as the flu. What would Brewster right. say today if someone kept her from visiting the Hamptons during a COVID-19 outbreak? Um. Oh, I think she would be livid. She would be doing everything she could to find a way around it. Um, and I know that not for what she wrote about illness, but when she was writing about getting books that were censored, documents that were censored or that were not supposed to be available to either Catholics or non-Catholics. Um, so she used what she could to get what she needed. Hmm. She was not one to live by the rules. So I don't know if that answers John Smaltzbauer's question, but that's a short, a short <laughs> version. Uh, Vanita Williams um, expresses, you know, that she doesn't necessarily know the biography. Was she married? So Anne Hampton Brewster never married. Hmm. Um, however, and I, I actually have published an article on this, um, and it's also an important part of the book chapter that I'm, I'm finishing up. Um, she was interested in intimate relationships with both men and women, but we don't have any evidence that they were ever consummated. And one of the things that I argue is that she was finally very afraid of intimacy. Hmm. That's great. Um, at some point, I'd love to get the article that you wrote about that so we can share it with the group if it's available in some form that's sure. accessible. Um, 
we have Elizabeth DeWolf uh, asked a really great question about American women of leisure. Um, and so she asked, uh, did American women of leisure have more freedoms in Italy than they would have if they stayed in the US? In other words, was uh, leisured social status as stultifying abroad as it would have been in US cities? So um, I have a feeling that the person asking this question has a pretty good answer to it herself. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will just um, say in answer to my question of why uh, Anne Hampton Brewster went to Italy the second time in 1868, that she did believe what she had read and heard and what she'd experienced in 1857 and 58, that women did have greater freedom. That doesn't mean that they weren't talked about. They were written about by people like Henry James, even in, uh, in after Brewster arrived there. Um, they were talked about as being too loose and too radical um, mm. by Italians as well as Americans, but that didn't stop them from going. Mm. That's great. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Stepanski, who, who I think you know, uh, because she says it's Lisa Stepanski. Um, she says, really interesting topic. I'm curious to know how you came to know of this woman. Also, uh, was she engaged in any discussions about medical science at this time? Um, so those are both great questions. And so I should say, I am so happy so far with all of the people that are asking questions. I know all of them will. So, <laughs> so thank you, friends. Um, and you're doing great on the pronunciation, too. So um, Lisa, you know, the research um, paths that we take are always fascinating. And I actually came to Brewster by reading a book in 2000 spring of 2011 called Their Other Side, about six American women in Italy. And it's a great read, but it hits on some of the big name people um, like Margaret Fuller. But in the introduction to that book, there's a long list of maybe 20 or 25 American women who were changed by their time in Italy with just brief descriptions. And since I work in the 19th century, I was looking through the names, looking for you know, people that I didn't know about because so many people had already written about Margaret Fuller and people had written about Henry James and Nathaniel Hawthorne. And so I was looking for new subjects and here's a reference to not a visual artist, not a sculptor or a painter, not an opera singer, but a writer to Anne Hampton Brewster. And since I'm in literary studies, I analyze text and I thought, here's a writer. I need to know more about her. And that's where I started the work. And it led me to Denise Larrabee's autobiography, and a, which is very short, and another short autobiography that was published in the 1930s by the li library company. Um, so that's how I got started. If you wanna know more, Lisa, um, you can ask some of the other friends of mine through the chat, how <laughs> long will Etta talk about women in Italy and Anne Hampton Brewster? <laughs> Longer than you care to listen. <laughs> Uh, Michael Duffy has a question about the relationship between unknown diseases and bigotry towards immigrants. Have you given that any thought as to what relationship so, there is? Yeah, so um, I think it's pretty obvious and I have not done research on it. I did quote from the book by Charles Rosenberg on the cholera years in America. And I think, um, you know, the quote that I, that I pulled out from that I think is a great starting point. So I have to say, I should have said this in the opening, um, even though I have written one article on the history of science that has to do with Benjamin Rush, I am not an infectious disease expert and I'm not a history of science expert, uh, but I do think it becomes pretty obvious and we know we hear that today as well. There are a lot of stereotypes. Well, maybe that's your next research project, huh? <laughs> All right, we have a question from Janine Hammer. Uh, can you explain Anne Hampton Brewster's issues with her own estate? As a woman of, of, of her time, she was privileged, but didn't she ha uh, struggle with being a single woman in her time? Um, so that's a great question, and I probably won't do justice to it, but I'll do the best I can. And there are sources that, that Will will provide that you can read at, and we can communicate as well by email if you'd like. Um, I mentioned her desire to be free from her brother and have financial independence from him. She, she was very close to her brother, but it was a fraught relationship. What happened when she and her brother were young is that her father got involved with, an, uh, with a woman that he wasn't married to and um, left Anne and her brother Ben and her mother together without the type of financial support that might have helped them. 
Um, what ended up happening after his death and after um, Anne's mother's death was a fight over the, the estate, over the inheritance. Um, and in fact, when Brewster went abroad in 1857, she had hoped to stay in Europe much longer, but because the, um, the legal issues with the estate erupted, she had to come back in 58 and deal with those. Um, so that's sort of a short version of what happened. So my understanding was that she was able to live in Rome partially from income from real estate that she was able to maintain um, and partially from the income from her news articles. But in her journals, the whole time she was abroad, she constantly worried about whether she had enough money. And I think that's one of those great ironies of privilege too. When we look at that palazzo where she lived and when we consider the clothing that she had and the way that she traveled, it's hard for us to imagine someone like that being so worried about money. So um, the details of the, the legal case, I have not looked into, but I do know there are other people that have. And if you want to know more about that, I will try to share what I can with you. So as uh, you're thinking about those journals, uh, we have a great question from uh, Christine Pierma, Pier, Pierpont, excuse me. Uh, no, excuse me. <laughs> Catherine Colkin, I'm jumping out of order here. Uh, she asks, did you start looking for information about cholera in her diaries after our current pandemic started, or did it just sort of jump out to you in our current context? So, Kate, that is a great question and something I'm, it's just amazing the way that research works. Um, I actually first read the journal that referred to quarantine in the spring of 2011, and I was... I was in Philadelphia for another conference and I had already found out about Brewster and I just wanted to see who she was. So I went into the library and I called a couple of the journals to see what her handwriting was like and what the writing was like. And I took notes on that then. And I have not been back to it. So what I'm relying on right now about the quarantine off the coast of Messina is strictly from the notes from 2011. But in March, as I was reviewing my notes, I came across the reference to quarantine. I was reviewing my notes for the book that I've been working on for so long, and it jumped out at me because of the cruise ships that were <laughs> sailing around looking for ports where they could land. And then the library company, through Will Fenton, posted this call for uh, fireside chats. And at that point, I thought, wow, um, you know, I would love to talk about Brewster and how she responded to the outbreak. So in answer to your question, this material that I presented tonight is pretty fresh. I mean, it, it's pretty fresh. What I want to do now is go back to that 1868 journal and see what did she write about that quarantine. But I don't know when the library company is going to open up and let me do that. Hopefully in July. Um, <laughs> but, you know, of course, all things are provisional in the current circumstances. And um, thank you for the plug for Fireside Chats. For anyone who is listening, who's done re um, research at the library company, whether on a fellowship or not, if you have a project you want to share, whether it's a completed book or a work in progress, um, get in touch with me. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to sort of bring in lots of different perspectives and different ways of thinking about our collections. And while we have a pretty full slate all the way through late August, early September, come the fall, we'll have a little bit more availability and I'd love to bring in some new voices. So now I wanna turn back to Christine Pierpont uh, who jumped up in my feed here. Forgive me, I've got old eyes. Um, she compliments you for a great lecture and asks, how do the subject matters of Brewster's writings differ from that of other American women in Rome at that time? Christine, that is a really good question that I have to think about longer than all the others. Um, so I haven't read private journal writings by other women in Rome exactly at this time. Um, I have read a little bit by the wife of the ambassador, um, Carolyn Crane Marsh, who's also one of the subjects of my research. She was living primarily in Florence, but she did keep one journal while she was in Rome, but hers was much more of a sort of, here's what I read today. Um, here's the people who came over today. It's much less narrative um, than these rich writings that, that, that Brewster left. Um, so I, I think I don't, ha I don't think that I've read enough journals to be able to answer that question. I will say, as I said earlier, 
Brewster journaled obsessively. She started keeping journals in the 1830s. And the finding aid at the library company tells you how many volumes there are. I have not been able to read all of them. There, there are too many pages. I tried to zoom in on the particular moments in Rome that I was most interested in because of the political upheaval that was going on. I don't yeah. know if that answers your question. No, I think, I think that that's really helpful. And I would add that um, back when I was working on my dissertation, I had a long-term fellowship at our sister institution, the American Philosophical Society. And I was working on a diary project where I was reading across their collections. And I had an opportunity to read a lot of women's diaries um, that were sort of, you know, travelogues in nature, but they rarely um, weighed into political context the way that you're describing is happening with Anne Hampton Brewster. Uh, so I think that that, that that maybe makes this project particularly interesting and her uh, a fascinating subject. Um, one sort of very obvious question that I regret not asking earlier is what the heck was she doing in Rome? You mean why Rome? Yeah, why Rome? Yeah. As opposed to Messina or Catania or Florence or is that? Yeah. Okay, yes. okay. Not like why did she leave Rome? Um, so Rome had, Rome, was in the news, the Roman question, what was going to happen with Italy? Was it going to be unified as one peninsula under one government? So Rome was the happening place, um, but she also had Philadelphia contacts who were there. Um, and so I think knowing like the Reed family, the Thomas Reed family, she lived with them upon her arrival. Um, and then she also went with the, um, con we would call it a contract now, the agreement with Gibson Peacock, who, who was the owner of the, and publisher of the Philadelphia paper, she went with the agreement to, to write about what was happening in Rome. So sometimes, you know, things just fall into place. Um, it could also have been motivated by a previous relationship that she'd had with Charlotte Cushman, who mm -hmm. was a senior to her, uh, a, a, an actress known as the female Romeo, they were no longer in uh, a close relationship, but Cushman's brother was also in Rome. So I'm speculating on why Rome, but I'm guessing it has to do with those relationships that were already established and the political excitement of the city. That's great. So we have um, just about exhausted our time. If anyone wants to get in a question under the wire, um, I'm happy to address it, but I do want to sort of tease our next, our next uh, Thursday for, uh, fireside chat with Mark Valeri, uh, who's gonna be talking about Protestant images of other religions in the 18th century. So a very capacious talk. I can't wait to see where he takes that. Um, of course, that would once again be um, 7 p.m., uh, 7 to 8, roughly. Uh, and it'll be in my living room, just like this one. So <laughs> welcome <laughs> to my home. <laughs> Thanks to everybody, too. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Etta. Um, you're always welcome back. If you want to do another fireside about your next project, I'm hoping that we're going to continue doing these for some time. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, guys.